Now, as we realize that all monosaccharides have chiral carbons, we have to remember that for chirality, we always expect some type of isomerism, and that is optical isomerism. So, we can further recall that optical isomers can either be enantiomers or diastereomers. The difference is that for enantiomers, all of the chiral carbons have been inverted, but for diastereomers, not all, or in other words, only some carbons, chiral carbons, have been inverted. In our classical basic organic chemistry, when we say inverted, it means an R chiral carbon has been switched to S and vice versa. But here, since we're not really uh, doing the exact same thing, we can simplify it to something like, if I say that this is a chiral carbon, I could say that this is inverted if this OH goes to the right. Or maybe if this is a chiral carbon, this has inverted if this right OH moves to the left. So it's basically switching from left to right or vice versa. So for example, I have here lysos and ribose, and then we recognize that the chiral carbons are here. Of course, we should already know that the aldehyde group and the CH2OH are not chiral carbons. We can analyze if their chiral carbons have all been inverted. So, since here I see that the first chiral carbon, this pair right here, has switched, and then the second one has also switched, right, and this is left, but the third one did not switch. My OH here is at the right. The OH here is also at the right. That's not all. It's only some. So I can say that lysos and ribose are dia, maybe just the letter D to shorten our time, diastereomers. For threos and erythros, let's see, the chiral carbons for these are only these two. And we see that for this first pair, left, this is right, so they have switched or they are opposites, uh, but for this one, I have my OH at the right, my OH is also at the right, so just like the pair above, they are what we can call diastereomers. But hold on, before we actually answer them as diastereomers, there is actually a special type of isomerism called epimerism. It is where there is only an inversion in one carbon. So again, when you say epimers, those are pairs where there's only a switch in one OH, or one carbon. So since here, it's the case, right? Um, how many carbons have switched between dithreos and erythros? Only this pair, this single carbon. So we can say that these two are actually epimers. So although you can call them as diastereomers, it is more, you know, specific if you call them epimers, okay? So next, we go to the spare right here, to aldohexosis, D-glucose, and D-galactose. And here we have four chiral carbons this time. So let's see. For the first pair of carbons, right, right, so they didn't change. So automatically, you cannot say they are enantiomers. So the second pair is actually the same also. Both are at the left. For the third pair, oh, this time, they're different. So, so far, we only have one carbon. Uh, which is carbon number 4, right? This is carbon number 4 that has switched. And then the last uh, carbon, both are at the right. So since only one carbon has inverted between these two carbohydrates, we can say magic number 1, right? We can also say that glucose and galactose are epimers. Now, sometimes you will be asked specifically at what number do glucose and galactose have an epimerism, meaning at what carbon do they differ? because there are other epimers of glucose. So since they have a difference only in carbon number 4, uh, you can actually read in some references that they are specifically 4 epimers. Now for the last pair, I actually didn't put the name because it's something I want to talk about in a bit. We can clearly see here, uh, CH2 OHs are not chiral, remember. The carbonyl here is not also chiral, and it only means that this is the only chiral carbon we have. And since the OH here is at the right and this is at the left, we only have a difference in one chiral carbon. But be careful this time, because even though we only have a difference in one chiral carbon, that's all that they have, right, in the first place. So can you say that there is only some, when in fact their only chiral carbon is all they have? So actually, we can call these two as actual enantiomers, because with the only chiral carbon they have, they actually switched. And the good thing about enantiomers is that they actually have the exact same name. 
Both of them have the name erythrulose. Erythrulose. And the only thing we need to do to separate them apart or to, to, to identify them apart is to look at the position of the OH. Remember, this is the penultimate carbon, and we need to identify if it's D or L based on the position of this OH. This OH is at the right, so this is D erythrulose, and this OH is at the left, so this is L erythrulose. Okay, so it's really something that you could uh, master more and more as you practice between these three types of, or among these three types of optical isomers. Now, of course, one of the major things that some of you may be thinking, especially if this is your first time for carbohydrates uh, in this technicality is, how do we know all of those um, aldoses or ketoses? And the thing is, you don't really need to memorize all of them. Uh, in fact, the examples I put here on the screen are some of the more popular ones, and I think it's better to stick with those. Because if you're going to insist on in memorizing all the common sugars, it's going to be tough. And a lot of these we don't really encounter unless you, let's say, specialize in, in a field like glycobiology, like allos, um, altros. We rarely encounter that in basic biochemistry. But if you insist, I showed you this diagram. And I think out of them, we will see uh, the following in the next topics. Uh, the triose, glyceraldehyde. Um, these two you've already seen, erythrose and threose. Among the pentoses, ribose is the most popular, but um, it really depends on the topic. Sometimes in some fields, you will hear of like arabinose or xylose. Then, of course, with the hexoses, no doubt we have glucose, mannose um, in some way. Um, and then galactose, and then the rest are really not as significant. Of course, they would be significant in their own respect, but probably not as popular as the ones I've highlighted. For the ketoses, actually, uh, I didn't draw any more because among the ketoses, really the most popular of all is fructose, which is the you know, ketohexose that we had okay, a while ago. And um, one nifty uh, trick that you can do is that every time you have a suffix ulose on a name, that ul is a clue to you that most likely that is the name of a ketose. For example, look at this. Wasn't it a while ago that we saw erythrulose and with the ul, that would actually give you a hint that it's a ketose. Okay. Now, that is actually not a universal rule because, for example, we do know that fructose is a ketose, but it doesn't have a UL in the middle of its name. So that's basically just a trick, but it's not you know, something that applies to all ketoses.